Welcome to the last video in our series about pediatric respiratory conditions. In this video, we're going to talk about croup, bronchiolitis, and epiglottitis. Croup actually refers to many conditions that cause upper airway obstruction. Classically, croup is referred to as kids who have a barking or seal-like cough. As we said, croup syndromes involve any condition that causes narrowing of the upper airway, as you can see in this illustration to your left. The resulting cough is usually inspiratory and is described as barking. Based on the degree of the obstruction of the airway, you may see other signs of respiratory distress as well, such as suprasternal or clavicular retractions. Because airways are smaller in younger children, we typically see these conditions in younger children from six to three years of age. And croup is very rare after six years of age. For the purpose of this video, we're going to refer to croup and laryngotracheobronchitis as the same thing. But keep in mind, there are several different croup syndromes. Laryngotracheobronchitis is exactly what it sounds like. It is inflammation of the upper airway. It's the most common type of croup syndrome. In fact, most people just call this croup. It's most commonly due to parent influenza virus type 1. However, there are many viruses that can cause this. And as we said before, in a child who has viral symptoms and a barking or seal-like cough, they likely have croup. If the obstruction of the upper airway is bad enough, you'll hear strider as well. The pathophysiology of croup is actually fairly simple. The virus enters the body through the respiratory tract and causes inflammation of the larynx and trachea, which narrows the airway and causes the signs that we see. During expiration, you have a large volume of air in your lungs. As you relax, that air pushes out through your trachea, and the pressure inside stents your trachea open. However, when you go to breathe in, which if you remember is an active process, this tries to pull air through your upper airway. If your upper airway is already narrowed, this can cause your upper airway to narrow even more as the air is trying to be sucked into the lungs. This is why we classically see inspiratory strider with these problems. And this is an illustration of what we just said. That negative pressure, which you can see, down in the lungs, pulling as it's trying to suck air in from the outside environment, pulling on that upper airway and causing it to collapse even more, causing strider. Other classic manifestations of croup include everything that you would expect with a viral illness, including rhinorrhea, congestion, cough, and some degree of fever. As with any other illness, we want to know the severity of the illness before we consider how to treat it. And we can make a croup score, such as the one shown here, to help guide our treatment of the child. Remember, the problem with croup is inflammation of the upper airway. If you have an inflamed bug bite, you may want to put an ice pack on it. We tend to do something very similar with croup. You can provide cool mist, or in the winter in Pennsylvania, you can take the child outside, and this will help reduce the edema in the airway and open it. You can also provide warm mist, such as placing the child in the shower. If the child only has mild croup, which is defined here as no strider at rest, we can just treat them with supportive care 
and reassure the parents that as long as they don't have any signs of respiratory distress, they should be fine in several days. Children with worse symptoms, such as labored breathing, strider, or respiratory distress, need immediate medical attention and should be referred to the emergency room. Racemic epinephrine is a nebulizer treatment that we can use to quickly address strider in the child with croup. Keep in mind that the upper airway inflammatory response is due to mediators that come in through your blood. Therefore, if we vasoconstrict those blood vessels, you'll have less inflammatory mediators and you'll have less inflammation. And that's exactly what epinephrine does. It vasoconstricts those vessels and it works very fast. However, it also wears off fairly quickly. So any patient that we see may need multiple treatments. The hallmark of treatment besides supportive care in croup is corticosteroids. Such as Decadron, we can treat the edema and inflammation in the upper airway with a single dose of steroids. Now let's talk a little bit about bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis is basically just what the medical term means. It's inflammation of your bronchioles. This is usually due to a viral infection and we see these during the times of year that viral infections are common. Most cases of bronchiolitis are caused by respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. However, it's important to know that any virus can cause bronchiolitis. And just like we've talked about in the past, the virus enters the body and then causes swelling, irritation, inflammation, and mucus production in the areas of the airways, which in this case are the bronchioles. Just like we saw in our asthma or CF patients, patients who have edema, inflammation, and mucus in their airways can lead to obstruction of their airways, poor aeration of the lungs past the mucus, and hyperinflation. The younger the child who has bronchiolitis, the greater the likelihood that severe disease will occur. And why is that? Simply because they have smaller airways. Initially in bronchiolitis, you'll see viral symptoms such as a runny nose, coughing, and sneezing. Wheezing, again, doesn't mean this child has asthma. It just means there's turbulent flow going past those areas of mucus and obstruction. As the illness progresses, you'll see worsening cough and wheezing. Tachypnea and retractions are two signs that the child needs extra help. If you're having trouble breathing, you're probably not able to eat very well. This is very true of younger infants who need to breathe, but also eat from a bottle. And you'll see copious secretions. Hopefully the child is seen before any of the symptoms of severe illness listed here. The diagnosis of bronchiolitis is typically made clinically. And what I mean by that is we don't really need any tests to prove that that's what's going on. We don't routinely do x-rays, but sometimes if we feel like one area of the lung sounds markedly different, or if they've been sick for too long, we can use an x-ray to evaluate whether they have concurrent pneumonia. And just like we talked about earlier, there are many viruses that cause bronchiolitis because the actual type of virus doesn't change how we treat it, we do not need to perform routine and expensive viral testing.
You've heard it before in many sections of our video series, but supportive care is the hallmark of treatment for bronchiolitis. Most children just need fluids, treatment for fever and comfort, and nutrition. Cool mist humidifiers can help as well. Again, all you're trying to do is reduce that inflammation and edema in the airways and thin that mucus so the kid can get it out. Anything more than mild bronchiolitis tends to need treatment either in the ER or admission to the hospital. If you're having respiratory distress, poor feeding, which may place the child at risk for dehydration or hypoglycemia, or if you're having hypoxemia, this is a child that probably needs to be seen and admitted to the hospital. And remember, if the child is breathing very quickly, they're at risk for aspiration if you attempt to feed them. So we prefer IV fluids for these children. For younger children, make sure you check glucose. High flow nasal cannula is a basically larger bore nasal cannula that can provide both oxygen to help with respiration, but also an increased level of flow to help with ventilation. This gets extra humidity and oxygen down into those airways, but also provides some positive pressure to keep the airways open so the child can breathe easier and so that we can get this mucus out. This is an illustration of a high flow nasal cannula system, which you can see is basically just a larger nasal cannula that's hooked to a humidifier and then attached to a gas blender so that we can change how much flow or liters per minute they need to help with work of breathing, but also blend in how much oxygen that they need to keep their sats in an acceptable range. We can give anywhere from 21%, which is room air oxygen, all the way up to 100% oxygen using this system. Finally, let's talk about epiglottitis. Anytime you see epiglottitis, think medical emergency. This is the little flap that goes on the top of your airway. And if it becomes severely inflamed and swollen, it can cause complete airway obstruction and death. Most episodes of epiglottitis are caused by H flu. And now that children get Hib vaccinations, we see this much less frequently. This is an example on bronchoscopy of what epiglottitis actually looks like. If you were to take an x-ray, you can see an inflamed epiglottis on a side view of the neck. Onset of epiglottitis is usually rapid and can quickly progress to severe respiratory distress. The child is uncomfortable and feels like they can't swallow or breathe. So you can see drooling, respiratory distress, and as well as the child sitting upright in a tripod position. Because it may suddenly develop, these children need to be seen immediately because obstruction can lead to hypoxia, hypercapnia, acidosis, and death. We do not even want to examine this child's airway or cause them any undue stress or anxiety before someone is there who can respond with emergency airway equipment. Because of the risk for complete airway obstruction, we typically treat epiglottitis with IV antibiotics. We may also use corticosteroids to help reduce the inflammation and edema. Thank you very much.